between those two determines and suggests, well, we're on the air. So we will return to our review for those that will hear the tape years down the line. We were just reviewing, and now we're going to go ahead and finish our dis lecture and discussion on Chapter 10 and get ready for our examination, which is pending. Uh, we are working our way through the New Communication Technologies chapter, which in one sense is sort of an extension of Chapter 9. But as I said last time, it is important that we take a look very carefully at new communication technologies and see what changes they are making in the way in which media, mass-mediated communication functions in our lives. Uh, we also are interested in questions surrounding the nature of the theories that we have used over the last number of years to explain media effects and to develop media policy, the role of media in people's lives. And one of the questions is, to what extent will various of the communication th media theories, media communication theories, survive well and help us to gu guide our, our policy and navigate our, our efforts uh, in the new communication technologies arena? Uh, for instance, one of the themes that seems to me that is very, very important, and we can begin to get our transparency up, although this one is not directly related to this term, uh, but the notion of communication determinism, I emphasized that early on in our discussion of mass-mediated communication. One of the arguments that we make is that the only way in which any medium loses popularity or influence or usefulness or is seen as gratifying is when a different medium comes along. Uh, there are some people who argue, for instance, that even if you run television through a computer that you still have television. There are other people who would say that it's now become a somewhat different medium, if not a substantially different medium, and it is an evolution rather than simply a replication or a replacement of the standard television venue. Uh, clearly, we have seen over the last number of years an evolution in television uh, from the point of time when we had one, two, or three networks to the point where we had more networks, then we had cable, and now if we have computer-assisted communication efforts so that people can, in one sense, sort of download or prepare or select television at their whim and will, then it becomes a different world, because it used to be that if you wanted to see I Love Lucy, and I mention that because it's been one of the longest playing, if not the longest playing, television program in the history of television has been on forever. As a matter of fact, I don't even know that there were ever any color uh, programs originally in I Love Lucy. It may have all been filmed before color was even a part of television. I honestly don't know, but it goes back a long time. And my understanding is if you want to see I Love Lucy today, you can still see I Love Lucy. It's still being run on cable somewhere at some time, but at some point, theoretically, you could download all of the I Love Lucy sessions uh, last night I was out at Target kind of rummaging among the DVDs. Uh, they now bundle them all in one way or another so that you can have them uh, to purchase. Uh, Sex and the City is there, The Sopranos is there, all kinds of programs there. But is there a time not too far down where you simply go online, you simply subscribe, download, you get your copies of the DVDs that you've paid for. We'll talk a little bit more about property and all of that in just a moment. but. Is that merely an extension of where television was, or is this a new era in television, where, for instance, you can pick and choose, download, get at your own whim and will what it is that you want? Uh, many people say that really does emphasize the changing nature of, of television, but it's become a whole new ball game uh, because we don't even have to show up when it's on the air. It's asynchronous, meaning that we don't have to be there in real time. It occurs when we want to uh, consume the medium, and perhaps we do so in a much more willful way in a uses and gratifications model, because here you are at the end of the semester, you're all worn out, you're just desperately waiting until all of the exams are over, and then you're going to go and you're going to get an evening of, of entertainment at Blockbuster, or you're going to sit in front of the television, or you're going to do whatever you want to do, or you've been storing up a bunch of DVDs or VHSs which you have created during the semester, and then you're going to utilize them. 
Uh, and I think that there's a lot of difference between your saying these are things that I would like to have and I'm going to get them and utilize them at my will and whim rather than simply assuming that we are sort of in a sense held hostage uh, to getting the stuff at the time that is presented. We now can be, as we emphasize in the nature of the new communication technologies, asynchronous. We do not have to be there at the broadcast time. Uh, we can figure out a variety of ways in which we can download and time shift, time change, uh, the particular venue that we have. Well, a uh, part of this is then this whole process of convergence, uh, compression, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. One of the things that I've got up here is convergent instruments such as cell phones or emerging communication options just in the last a couple of days I saw a piece in the Wall Street Journal that now say your generation, not my generation, your generation is now using cell phones for everything and your biggest challenge at the moment is to get batteries sufficient to be able to use what it is that you have available. You can now watch movies on cell phones. Wow, isn't that exciting? I can't quite imagine something like The Last of the Mohicans, which I think is a visually very rich kind of movie on something that is about the size of a postage stamp. Somehow I don't think that Daniel Day-Lewis and uh, Uncas and all of what was going on in that movie will be quite as good, but there you are. You can have it. Uh, maybe it's office space. Maybe that's what you want to download and watch on your phone while you're at work as a way of sort of accommodating to the to the oppressive, unobtrusive control culture in the organization uh, where you are working, which is making you, you know, dead at the shoulders up and or down. Well, we deal with virtual reality. Virtual reality means that in many ways the new communication technologies can do much more at our whim and will. I understand that we can now shop online in all kinds of increasingly interesting ways. You can see stuff. You can watch it work. Oh, I've done some research and some consulting work with the oil field of services companies now where they have provided at their websites all kinds of drilling equipment activities so that an engineer at some company wanting to use that equipment can go online and watch it grind and whir and whiz and all of that sort of thing. Uh, and some of you would say, why don't they just send out videotapes? They did that for years, and then they found out that no engineer on a given day could ever find in the videotape what it was he wanted to look at or she wanted to purchase or consider. But if you have that same kind of moving image at the website, people can go there and they can look. Uh, I guess, I don't know whether it's still true, Mattress Mac used to allow you to go shopping in his... Uh, his bedding department or his furniture department, obviously hardwood, and he will not uh, give you a back order. He will save you money and deliver tonight. And the notion is that you can also have the cameras move around in there and you can see the furniture without even having to get out of your car and go to Tidwell and Parker and see where mattress is and what's going on. Uh, presence. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is this sense of being in the environment. Being in the environment. Uh, people have commented about the incredibly interesting and or terribly boring special effects in the last of the trilogy and the Matrix, uh, but we now know that given the era of my time, one of the most interesting visual moments was the burning of Atlanta. Some of you have seen that in Gone with the Wind. Uh, we've got a horse, and, uh, and the horse is about to die, pulling a buggy with scarlet and red, and in the backdrop there is a screen. Uh, it's backlighted, and we have the burning of Atlanta. Nowadays, we would have that in enormously graphic detail uh, with probably human bodies flying in all directions and things blowing up and uh, gushing arteries and all the other things that make television such a wonderful sort of thing. Uh, what is natural, what is, what is true, what is real, all of these things can become kind of uh, confusing, interesting, requiring, among other things, a firm understanding from the cognitive theories approach to media studies, a way in which people understand and manipulate and utilize the media for their particular interest. They have to understand it, they have to uh, appreciate what it has and can do for them, and sometimes we know, and this is all already available, but will become even more so, uh, we're able to have specific kinds of endings of movies that we want, 
Uh, if we want the super duper uh, explosion ending and all of that kind of thing, we can. Uh, not long ago, I bought a video of something, I forget what it was, a DVD. And they gave me an option to see various scenes that they had deleted, some of which I thought were better than the scenes that they had actually cut or had left in. They'd cut and set aside, et cetera, et cetera, and I thought they made the bad choices. Well, all of a sudden, our whole approach to television and viewing and such and such becomes a lot different. Our whole sense of what is nature, what is natural, what is uh, our perception of what's going on. Telepresence, the experience of presence in an environment by means of a communication medium. Uh, with the new computer, computer assisted, uh, I'm sorry, with the new computer assisted media that we have out there, uh, we can get much closer, we can get more into things than we could ever uh, uh, have imagined in the last number of years. And I think that's very important. I think that suggests the, the power of the media in terms of bringing us information. I think it also suggests that uh, largely what's going to explain media impact over the next number of years has a lot to do with the predictions of uses and gratifications. Uh, that life indeed is a great big cafeteria and we're all in line to go through this large array and pick and choose what it is that we want and tailor it to our own interests, our own demands, our own time, our own lifestyle, and to be able to do that. In that regard, then, there are some ethical and policy considerations. Yeah? Uh, just curious, David, uh, um, are we supposed to have a review today? Yes, you are. You bet. You bet. We're going to review today, as we always have after we give some lecture, right? I want to make sure. Who knows the answer to these questions, all right? If I'm not fitting your time schedule, then I guess we'll have to tell a shift. Unfortunately, the part that would be tell a shifted most interesting, which would be the review, will not be on television, because I think it becomes problematic for subsequent generations. Anyway, uh, some ethical and policy considerations. One of the questions is control. To what extent do people have more or less control over the images that they have? Also, control over people's access to information. I think that as we see increased media access through computer-assisted technologies, that the community has more control over the information that they get. Uh, even in that regard, any individual, as I said before, with a digital camera can become a journalist providing pictures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think it'll be interesting uh, as we maybe get more and more information about whatever happened in the city in Iraq where there's a lot of difference of opinion uh, between the locals including the police officers and medical officials and so forth and the American military uh, intelligence and so forth uh, the military uh, public information officers as to what actually happened there uh, any individual in that community that had a digital camera can immediately become a journalist providing information about whatever they may have seen whatever may have happened there Privacy rights become very important. We've talked a little bit before about privacy. To what extent do I have the privacy to say what gets to me? We have fought this battle over the last number of years with direct mail, junk mail, with telephone, unsolicited telephone calls, and now we have spam. People knocking on my door saying to me, I want to intrude into your privacy. I can get inside of your communication space. Uh, even if you don't want me here, I can figure out ways to do that. Uh, is that not a violation of my privacy? Should I not be able to screen these out in an ever more uh, systematic and aggressive way saying I will be attentive? Some people say, well, all you have to do is to go through there and delete all of these messages, but we know that at various times, uh, particularly you know, who we are and maybe what access we give ourselves and others give to us in the world around us, uh, I talk to any number of people and I'm sure some of you are those who come to work or come to you know whatever social activities or play or research or whatever it is you get on the internet and there are any number of unwanted messages which you have to sort through uh, what also can happen is that wanted messages can get treated as spam yesterday a message that was mass disseminated by the Texas Public Relations Association a group that I'm interested in came to me as spam well it wasn't spam but it was treated as spam so that becomes problematic Property rights, if I set up a web, to what extent do you have the right to go in there and tinker with my web? 
to what extent do you have rights to download my music where I've copyrighted and play it and share it without ever having to pay the cost of the freight. We get into a lot of these kinds of issues. To some extent we know that the web, that the web has offered us an enormous resource for research, for obtaining and manipulating media to our particular needs, interests, desires. By the same token, we know that the web now is going to have some kind of concomitant effect upon culture. Uh, there is something that we can easily call a web culture. Uh, one of the things that happens is that messages can go around the world in a very, very short period of time. And sometimes these messages can come to us in a very unfiltered way. Uh, there was a series of messages going around one summer that had to do with a chemical product that was used in toothpaste and in shampoos and it was alleged to be a carcinogenic. It was often either attached or simply just picked up and we know that many of us have forwarding protocols in our email uh, address books where we can send a message to a lot of our friends forward to and we forward it to 10 who forward it to 10 who forward it to 10 and forward it to 10 and pretty soon we're talking about really big numbers message comes to us from our friends. So it would be credible, wouldn't it? Except for the fact that this message alleged that Health Canada had ruled it was a carcinogenic. Health Canada had ruled exactly the opposite. It also listed a researcher at the University of Pennsylvania who had found that this substance was a carcinogenic. There was no such person. So it was an absolute lie. Some people would call it cyber sabotage. Perhaps it was put out either by competitors and or by the people who put out non-chemical products for hair care, or toothpaste, or something of that sort. So we can get a lot of misinformation as well. But in that culture, we can share a lot of stuff with one another. We also know that we can gain access to stuff uh, for generations down the line. I can mention, for instance, that a young woman by the name of Paris Hilton is now quite popular because she and a young man apparently uh, in one way or another had some very private moments of their life get spread onto the internet. Meaning that in a sense our private life can be very much uh, intruded into. Uh, that can become a part of culture as well. Uh, some of that also has to do with privacy. There's a lot of concern for instance as to whether uh, video or television uh, telephone uh, cameras or the phones that can take pictures and disseminate them, uh, whether that's uh, something that it can be used irresponsibly. People with those kinds of devices uh, in very private situations can create images and disseminate those images that maybe better were kept uh, very private. So perhaps the nature of our culture, we can become an ever more intrusive culture, we can get more into other people's lives, uh, we can reduce privacy, sometimes that may be very good, sometimes that may be very, very bad. I know, for instance, that there is something called cyber stalking. Uh, I had a graduate, I mean an undergraduate student who was cyber stalked by this guy. So there are all kinds of issues that the new communication technology raises. I doubt that uh, stalking uh, in uh, television would have occurred in the age of our friends at uh, uh, Lucille Ball, I Love Lucy show. Web access, web fairness, web equality, web safety. Uh, safety becomes an issue. Children can get access to information, uh, pictures, and so forth that maybe they are not mature enough to fully uh, understand intellectually and respond to perhaps in somewhat very difficult ways. Uh, some of that can have to do with sex. Uh, some of that can have to do with hate. Uh, so we have a hard time protecting children during an age of innocence from something that we may wish to want to protect them from. I know that various individuals try hard on their own home uh, computers to protect children, uh, but then we have to assume that those computers are not always uh, protected everywhere where the children are. Uh, and I would be willing to argue that um, there is no one more devious in pursuit of stuff he or she should not have than a 12-year-old. Equality, to what extent do we have equal access? Uh, one of the critical cultural questions about the new media uh, center on the matter of to what extent uh, is there a financial burden uh, that then prohibits access to new communication technologies by people who can simply not pay. 
Uh, this is a very real evolution in media, typically. Uh, books once were very, very expensive. Uh, we even know that at one time, Bibles were chained to churches. So access to information uh, can be very much a matter of the structure of a society, including the economics of a society. I remember as a young, poor farm boy in western Colorado that the one thing that you hoped for was to have rich friends where you could go over and watch television, which is really bad television in western Colorado. Not only was there little of it, but it was always snowy because television didn't do well in the Rockies. That's one reason it took so long to get there. Uh, but the real point was that you wanted friends who could afford a three or four hundred dollar television. A three or four hundred dollar television, I paid four hundred dollars for a used car. So you get an idea of the relative cost of television when I was a kid. That was not color television, folks. That was your basic black and white. Some of you don't even know what black and white television is. So to what extent is there inequality? Do poor people have access to the web? Uh, years and years and years ago, we argued that people would squander their money and buy television. Uh, I had some rental properties, and it was interesting that one of the first things that people in our rental properties would do, these were rental properties for people who did not have a lot of money. Uh, one of the first things that people would do if they were from South America was subscribe to cable. Uh, they wanted cable because it gave them soccer. Soccer is more important to them than many other aspects of their life. Uh, so people will work hard to get the information, get the entertainment. Uses and gratification is alive and well. Do libraries provide a sufficient outlet in that regard? Do schools provide a sufficient outlet? Is there enough of that within a community? Are there underserved populations where telemediated communication could be very, very real. We are working on a project through the School of Communication with Baylor College of Medicine to provide health-related messages predominantly to Hispanic women through a telenova kind of context presented through television kiosks where they can use computer-assisted technologies to get on-demand information about various health issues. Uh, these kiosks will not be placed everywhere. Uh, we're talking to organizations such as Fiesta Foods. Would you be willing to put a kiosk in your company, in your uh, food stores? And it would be obviously a selling point from their point of view that women could use these as a part of their shopping, but it would also give them access to health-related information. Fairness, to what extent is Fairness is an important issue here. Do all people have equal access to information? Never have, probably never will. John Kennedy, son of one of the wealthiest people in the United States, once said life is not fair. And I guess we're sort of stuck with that. To what extent is it unfairly fair? unfair? And we indeed have to deal with that issue. Information commons, we talked a little bit about that last time. Democratization, do the new communication technologies democratize society? I think it's very interesting to see in this particular campaign year, and I guess every year now forever will be a campaign year. We will always have presidential campaigns. Uh, but apparently the website that uh, Dr. Howard Dean established has not only been wonderfully useful to him in fundraising, but it has also been a way in which he could link to other organizations, provide platforms, and reach a lot of people in a very cost-effective way. People who want to find out what, Harold, uh, what Howard Dean believes or what uh, George Bush believes or what any of the other candidates for political office believe can now go to websites. In one sense, that can be a democratization where we have a greater sense of the, uh, of the, the village speaking within itself, to itself. I've even written an article, and a good friend of mine, uh, Tim Coombs, has written an article where we argue that the, the Internet allows for a lot more parity uh, in terms of issue debate and issue communication, where Shell Oil Company debating Greenpeace, Shell has lots of money to spend on communication, Greenpeace has very little, but on the net, uh, there is a lot more parity there. Some people would say, but whoever goes there and sees those debates, and the answer is people who are, e who are deeply interested in that, and those are the people that you're trying to reach. Mass dissemination of information doesn't mean mass impact of information. In all of this, we now have a tendency for the lack of professional vetting of news and information. Uh, one of the gatekeeping roles of reporters is to sort of tell us what is true and false. 
Uh, not only do reporters get sucked into this at various times, but we also know that there are all kinds of, of absences. It's going to, uh, of this ability of news gathering, vetting, uh, editorializing, and so forth. What's going to happen, I think, is that more of the large organizations are going to utilize their websites uh, under the heading of being the first and best source of information on all matters relevant to their organization. So that they're the ones that have to provide the information. I think that that's a very useful kind of, of challenge where we know that we can go there and get information and they have to be there to provide information and to the extent that they're not, then the uh, information, however erroneous it is that is put out about them, uh, then essentially goes unanswered. I think that that's a real positive that will come out. Communication determinism is one of the theories I think that is going to be further demonstrated to be true as we see the changes in new technologies. Uh, the argument being that no technology tends to die until a new technology comes along and replaces it. Uh, the same is true of all of the economic forces of society, as we mentioned once before, the work of particularly Harold Innes on this notion suggested that horse-drawn equipment worked wonderfully well until tractors came along, etc., etc. We now even have computer-assisted tractors, computer-assisted harvesting and planting equipment. If you don't believe that, I'll bring in a copy of Furrow. I get that because I bought a John Deere tractor, and John Deere is proud of all of its computerized farming equipment out there now. Uses and gratifications, I think, is one of the theories that is going to be very much bolstered. The argument being that with we have more media richness, we are able to pick and choose that which is most useful to us and that which is most gratifying. We can get information in a much quicker way through the Internet more often than not if we are in information acquisition. Uh, if I want to know whether it is raining in my place up in the country, I can get online and at least get an idea whether I have a big red mark or a yellow mark or a green mark over my little place out in the country. We couldn't do that before unless we called somebody and said, hey, look outside and see if it's raining. Meaning that there's a lot of uses and gratifications going on. We can tailor, we can pick and choose, we can select. Heavens only knows what the future in all of this turns out to be where you have increased access to all of this kind of stuff. Critical studies and cultural theory will always and eternally worry about the images that are presented, but they are less likely to be worried when you are in greater, uh, when you have greater access to pick and choose what you want. If one of the things that critical cultural people worry about is the ad content that you see too much of, giving you a lifestyle that they think is not right for you, including too much fast food advertising, you are very likely to be able to get all kind of entertainment in your life that is simply not brought to you by the fast food industry, by advertisers but you're going to have to pay for it. Somebody somewhere is going to have to pay for this stuff. So it's a question of whether the ad people pay for this, whether the subscription people pay for this, whether donations pay for this, uh, who pays for it because none of this is, is without cost. Critical cultural theory worries also about the images that are presented to us. I would say that images of men, women, and so forth can be either more wholesome or less wholesome uh, based upon the access that people have to the media. Uh, there's been a lot of attention, for instance, to the dehumanizing de uh, elements of pornography, and heavens only knows that there's a lot of pornography on the Internet. Uh, so the critical cultural people would be very disturbed by the ease of access that we have to that and, the, and the, what many people argue is the de denigrating portrayal of women in pornography. Reinforcement theory, I would argue, again, it survives pretty well in this new environment. It argues that we tend to seek information that we want. We tend to recall selectively. We tend to use information selectively. And I think the new communication technologies will very much allow us to do that uh, because we will have much greater access to get what we want. We don't have to wait for an article to come out on a topic. We can simply go in and search for information on that. We don't have to wait for an ad on a particular product. We can go in and search for information on that. 
So the notion of being selective uh, becomes very, very important to us in this regard. Innovative incentive and ability. Uh, there are theories that are developed. We'll see one of these down the line. Of two of these are mentioned on page 393 in the book, uh, Media System Dependency Theory and Social Information Processing Theory. Uh, both of these in one way or another talk about innovative incentives. Uh, the early adopters, people that are going out there and finding stuff. I think one of the things that's interesting about the Internet is it allows you and or your friends to find stuff and then send it on to you. Have you seen this website? Have you seen this? Have you seen that? Here's some stuff. You want the latest statements about this and that and the other thing. Do you want to know what Howard Dean says? Do you want to know what Kerry says? Do you want to know what Bush says? Do you want to know all of this kind of stuff? Uh, it seems to me that there's a lot of innovation. Uh, probably there's also an enormous amount of conversation on the part of people your age. Uh, the argument is, uh, based upon my reading of the Wall Street Journal, that you are compulsive to have the latest phone with all of the niftiest gadgets that do all of the finest things for you. Uh, and so anyone out there that is an innovator is the first to get the blackberry, the strawberry, the greenberry, the gooseberry, the, all of these kinds of things. And so we're in this frenzy of using the innovative leader, the diffusion of innovation through friends of ours, does it work, all of this kind of stuff. I saw four students standing together in the library one day taking pictures of one another. I have no particular idea why they thought the library was a good place to do that. Uh, but one of them was saying, now here's a new person that we just met and don't you see the image and isn't this a wonderful phone? And I'm thinking, uh, these people are selling phones. You know, they're selling phones. Uh, they are innovative. They are showing other friends and then probably part of the conversation was, no, that's a terrible phone. I can't really see that person or maybe I see more of that person than I would really want to know. A multi-step influences, the notion is that in multi-step influences, a lot of information can be handed on to one another. Uh, we talk about two-step flow, we talk about multi-step flow where we have on one hand the mass media providing in this kind of ostensible linear fashion information out there but the way in which we access and think about the standard media is often influenced by the interpersonal contacts, the opinion leader contacts. And I think now what we find is that access to the opinion leader is ever more easy when we have the Internet. Uh, we can have friends of ours that are a long ways off. We don't have to get on the telephone necessarily and talk to them because nobody ever is anywhere with a telephone unless you're on a cell phone and then they beep all the time. I see one student with his right here in case his broker has to call him at a moment's notice by seller trade. I mean, you know, this is a big deal. I actually grew up in a time when you, one, had to have a dime. I maybe even remember when you had to have a nickel. You had to have a pay phone, and you didn't care whether anybody called you because anybody that you wanted to talk to was within arm's length. And now I even find students in the cafeteria, the university center, calling one another saying, I can't find you. Rather than simply walking and looking, you say, well, where are you? I can't find you, and I couldn't possibly find you without some stupid cell phone helping me to do that. Well, the notion is that we are... In a multi-step way, we can get a lot of information very, very quickly. I'm out shopping. I want to look for something. When I was in New Zealand, I had to call in almost real time to my wife saying I'm in this buying frenzy because woolen goods are discounted. Buy, I wanted to buy woolen goods for Houston, Texas. I have no idea, but they were selling for about 40 cents on the dollar because of the exchange rate. And I was calling my wife at $28 a minute or some stupid <laughs> amount trying to ask her what kind of woolen sweaters and jackets that she wanted. Well, I could have had my cell phone right there. How many of you, I will not ask for a show of hands, standing looking at a product or literally talking to any number of people about whether you ought to buy it at a given time. You see what I'm talking about? Multi-step flow. Those opinion leaders are not somebody that you have to talk to at coffee. They're people that can be right there in real time. Um, could you go over a two-step flow? Two-step flow argued years ago there was a study in the voters choice reported in a book called the voters choice where they went out and they asked individuals as a way of sort of getting a sense of the baseline data on the emerging role of television in political campaign communication they asked people what form of communication was the most influential to them in making decisions about political candidates and they wanted really to begin to see the emerging influence of of, of television and they found that most people indicated that interpersonal contact. 
So the reason that we then talk about the two-step flow is that one flow comes from the media, which we can see, television, radio, or print, and then we have the influence of the influence leader. And the argument was that the influence leader's opinions about political candidates is far more important on us than the advertising and the news commentary that is presented to us in the media. Okay? So multi-step flow then su simply suggests that there are a lot of people in our conversational community out there, all of whom can provide various kinds of information to us. Media system dependency, we talked a little bit about dependency theory before. One of the arguments, and it grows out of media systems, I mean it grows out of multi-step uh, influence, is that the media are an important part of our social life. Uh, they are more important to us if we have less interpersonal contact, or they are important to us as they fit into our interpersonal contact. Uh, I would say a very good example of that is now your cell phones. Uh, I have literally heard that children are alleging child abuse against their parents if they are not given their own cell phone at an age where they believe that that's early enough. It used to be child abuse had something to do with being beat to a pulp, and now it has to do with I didn't get a cell phone at the age that I thought was necessary, da 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 right? So the notion is to what extent are we dependent upon the media to do something for us, to what extent do they fit into our interpersonal life? Do, uh, does our interpersonal life play a disproportionate role over our media utilization? Or does media utilization play a disproportionate role because of something about our interpersonal life? Uh, when we talked about dependency theory before, we suggested that one of the reasons that older people watch more television is that, one, they like the sound of voices. They also get an image of other people. They feel less lonely. It's a way of maintaining contact with the real world when it becomes difficult for them to get out and to go and, and be a part of the same social groups that they were a part of before. In a sense, then, we begin to see audiences become dependent on the media as media. By the same token, media are dependent upon audiences and advertising. Social information processing theory is the theory that I talked about in terms of the ways in which uh, the innovators in our life begin to give us a sense that we need this new device and that new device, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and largely, people my age tend to resist a lot of that. It took a long time for me to ever decide to buy a personal computer. I, computer, I really couldn't see it. When I ask people, why should I have a personal computer? Uh, one of the arguments is so that you could prepare lists. I grew up thinking that's what pens and paper were for, is to create a list. Why do I need a $3,400 computer with 64K of memory to develop a list? You can write papers. Oh, well, that makes it more sense. Makes more sense to an academic. Word processing is something that I respond to, right? Well, anyway, innovation is influenced by earlier adopters. Cognitive theories. Cognitive theories suggest that we can manipulate the media and or we understand the media depending upon how well we you know, what we remember, what we knew, all of this kind of stuff. I think one of the best examples of cognitive theory is the game capabilities uh, that are allowed in, in the new technologies. Games requiring that you have to remember, learn, and use moves and maneuvers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, this is so fascinating, as some of you know, that there is now international competition among people to see who is the best at these games. Structural functionalism, networks, networks change. We're not talking now just about the major network, but that too is changing. The amount of audience loss that occurs on the part of the major networks every year is in a continual downward slide. More and more people having more and more access to what it is that they want without having to just rely upon ABC, NBC, and CBS. Uh, even in that regard, some of the staples, such as news and weather, are now much more readily available in other venues, including the Weather Channel and or the weather sites that are readily available 
on the, on the internet. Yellow pages used to be a relatively staple part of every household now on the internet. White pages, a very staple part of every household now on the internet. So forth and so forth and so forth. All of these changes suggesting different ways in which we network. Different networks which we are a part of. Well, I guess if I blink that last page and there is nothing on it, that means we have ended that part of our life together and we are now ready we are now ready for a review. Shall I turn the mic off and just Thank mm -hmm. you.